Welcome everyone to Man After God, where we take current events and analyze and make sense of them from a biblical perspective. What does God have to say about this situation? What does the Bible have to say about this? And today we're going to be sharing two clips, one where this is uh, Adam Smith, uh, I believe his full name. Yes, Adam Smith Connor. He was arrested. So this first clip we're going to play is when he was arrested. And then we're going to play the other clip where unfortunately he was also convicted. Before we get started, if you are in the Toronto area and would like to join us for church, please join us this Sunday at 1.45 p.m. at Conquer Assembly, located at 3730 Kingston Road. Now, in a situation like this, when someone is found guilty for praying silently, for thinking, this raises significant questions about the democracy that we live in, or quote-unquote democracy that we live in, religious freedoms, or quote-unquote religious freedoms, the role of government when it comes to our thoughts, what we say. We're not just talking about freedom of speech right now at this point. We're talking about freedom of thought right now, and the right to think, the right to pray, the right to, in our conscience, to to think. that This is almost bizarre that this is happening, and what is this telling us from a, from a biblical and theological standpoint? There are several principles here that we can draw from and, and how was our response to this? So we're going to be covering this and first before we go into this clip we want to talk about the the primacy of of prayer and worship of God over human law. Now I get it human law we should submit to. I mean in the Bible God's authority and commands they take precedence over human laws and especially if those human laws directly oppose our worship to God. Uh, the laws are supposed to protect us from that but if they are incriminating us then what can we do? What is our response to this? And and this is most clearly seen in the example of the early church, the apostles, who when commanded to stop preaching the gospel, their response was this in, in, in Acts 5, 29. We must obey God rather than men. And because they obeyed God rather than men, we have Christians today. We're able to hear about the word of God. We're able to study the word of God because these early believers obeyed God first. Similarly, in the Old Testament, Daniel continued praying to God despite King Darius' edict that forbade such prayer. We see this in, in Daniel 6, and eventually it leads to his arrest. He's thrown into the lion's den, and somehow, someway, his faithfulness was rewarded by God, who protected him and preserved him. So, number one, when the governments that are, first and foremost, they're established by God to maintain order, we see this in Romans 13.1, when they overstep that, that bound, and when the government starts to infringe on our God-given rights to worship and to pray. Christians are commanded to honor the government, right? To, to honor the government in so as far as it does not contradict God's law. Just like the early apostles, they obeyed the law to the point where, okay, this is enough. We have to obey first and foremost God's law. Just like Daniel, he continued to pray, even though it was outlawed. Now, are we back in the, those times? Now, some people would think this is insane that we would be forbidden to even think, to even pray. Are we, are we forbidden to meditate? And we're called, as followers of Jesus Christ, to prioritize obedience to God above all else. Now, we're going to go into this video. The wind is pretty strong in this video, but we'll see what happens here. This is his initial arrest. We just wanted to sort of come over to say hello. Sure. Also, just to apply to your activities. Well, I'm praying. Uh, just for your awareness, you are in an area which is governed by a public space protection. If you're aware, I am aware. Of public space protection. Um, they also call it a safe zone. There are signs located in the area, uh, just to make you aware of that in the area where certain activities. Yeah. So apparently, this is a safe zone where there's certain activities that are permit prohibited, and there are even signs up there. And Adam is obviously he's he's agreeing to what's happening here. In terms of the, uh, can I ask what is the the nature? Of what is the nature of that? I'm praying to my son. I, I don't want to pray, but I don't want to do that. Sure. At the same time, it would be not mentioned. Sure. Uh, in terms of that, there is the public yeah. disapproving activities at the clinic here. Right. Um, now, the clinic that they're talking about is indeed a, an abortion clinic. And Adam would say that he's praying for his son. He would communicate later that he's praying for his deceased son. And I think, you know, we're going to be talking about later, is there a point? And, and why would the government, and at the end of the day, we know that demonic forces are in effect here. Why would they want to stop this? And one of the things we're going to be talking about later is that prayer is powerful, whether it is out loud or whether it's silent. As I said, because I don't want to pray as to the, the reasons that your country is under the influence. It's perhaps pertinent to the area that you are in. And like I said, it's been a little bit of a session. I'm praying to my son who's deceased. 
Okay. So again, sorry for your loss, but ultimately I have to go to the station manager. Right. Um, they say that we are in the belief, therefore, that you are in breach of what it says about prayer and also acts of disapproval and activities. The reason for arresting him at this point is because he's praying near the clinic and it is showing that it is an act of disapproval. So his opinion of something can get arrested. His thought, his silent prayer over something can be arrested. We would later find out that he was there for a few minutes before the police came. It's understanding praying. I understand that, but the SPO is in place for a reason. We do have to follow through on those regulations. So there's regulations in place. There's laws in place that you cannot stand silently and pray. This is wild. This is, I'm really in disbelief right now. now He's gonna get arrested. Now the question is, when this goes to law, what is the response of the court? And I think that the reason why they're so threatened by this, even if it's silent prayer, is because there is power even in silent prayer. Now some of you might say, well, should we pray out loud? Should we pray silently? Should we pray lying down? Should we pray just in our minds? Or should we be speaking it together? Well, silent prayer, biblically, is valid and it biblically is powerful. Remember Hannah, the mother of Samuel, who became a great prophet of Israel. She prayed silently, moving only her lips, but her prayer was heard and it was answered by God. In fact, she, she, she was praying almost nonsense from the outside, but her heart was really connecting with God. And Jesus also instructs his followers to pray in secret. Pray in se secret, why? Well, because it's not ostentatious. We're not, trying to, we're not trying to get attention for ourselves. Sometimes when we pray in secret, even in our minds, this ensures that our focus is really on God and not a public display of something. You see, even in this video, he's not on the ground, he's not laying out a mat, he's not, you know, screaming, right? It's just in his mind. All of these examples in the Bible, uh, demonstrates in the Old Testament, New, De New Testament, they, they, these are examples that silent prayer, personal prayer, is it's intimate, it is valid, and God hears it. And the attempt to criminalize silent prayer, as we saw here, to, to regulate it, in the case of Adam Smith, Connor, this is an attempt to control not only our outward actions, not only our words, but also inwards, right? Our conscience, what we're thinking. And the government's reach into the realm of thought, especially silent communication with God, this is a violation of personal liberty. And this contradicts the biblical understanding of prayer as an act of heart worship, as an act of spirit worship, when we, spirit, we worship it in spirit, in truth. And I don't think this should be dictated by government, by human laws. And the fact that it is, is scary. And that's why this, this went to court, right? And, and we know that, we're gonna pray, play it right here, actually. Let's see if we can, uh, is this it right here? We just want okay, no, that's not, that's the wrong link there. Let me grab it here for you guys, because this is absolutely wild. Now, it's one thing. Hello. It's one thing to get arrested by it, but what is the court's response to this? Okay, because now we're gonna see here um, the, the ruling. So that was in 2022, and uh, this just happened literally a week ago. And we know that persecution for righteousness, for, for, for doing the right thing, it's, it's part of Christian life. The Bible repeatedly prepares us believers for reality that those who are faithful to Jesus will face persecution. I know that's not a popular message, but it's a biblical message. Because Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 10. And the apostle Paul also wrote that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It will happen. It will, it will, you'll be persecuted because of your faith. You'll be persecuted because of your love for Jesus Christ, your loyalty to Jesus Christ. This is part of it. And the early, ch the early church faced frequent persecution from both the religious system and the government government authorities. For what? For adhering to their faith. You know, persecution, though it's painful, is often a confirmation that you're living faithfully in a fallen, broken world. And so if you are being persecuted, my friends, then there is a call to endure with suffering for the sake of Christ, knowing that ultimately vindication will come from God, that vengeance is the Lord's. And that somehow, some way, all things will work together for the good of those who love him who are called according to his purpose. We see this in Romans 8. The, the criminalization of prayer reflects a deeper cultural and spiritual brokenness and hostility towards Jesus, towards God himself. And how are we to respond to this? And believers are called to respond with steadfast faith and love, trusting in the sovereignty and ultimately authority of God over the authority of government and courts like this. And we're going to see a response here where I think he, he really lines up and lives up to, to this because he sees it through and he fights it in court. So we've just received a verdict from the judge in the case of Adam Smith Connor. She has found Adam guilty um, for his silent prayers. This is a shocking verdict. Adam, what would you like to say on, on receiving this verdict? Well, I just want to thank everyone for the support over the last two years. Uh, since I was first accused of this thought crime on the 24th of November, 
2022. Uh, Psalm 22 verse 10 says, When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. I served our great nation for 20 years as an army reservist. I continued to serve my local community as a physiotherapist and a, and a church volunteer. I never imagined that the nation I love and has been so good to me in the past could turn on me for doing nothing more than offer up a prayer for my deceased son. I felt like my government had forsaken me, but the Lord has taken care of me, surrounded me with prayer and provided me with an excellent uh, legal team with the ADF UK. I want to thank anyone, everyone who's been praying for justice in this court. I've received messages of support from across Britain, America, Italy, and even in Bethlehem, the birthplace of Christ. I'm extremely saddened that the judge has found me guilty. This marks a dark and dangerous day for our nation, setting a legal precedence that thought crimes can occur in England. When George Orwell wrote 1984 in the year 1948, he meant it as a warning, not as a guidebook. It seems Orwell's predictive powers were off by 40 years, but apart from that, the notion that thought crime could become established in the British legal system was sadly accurate. Two years ago, when this case started, a, a Christian friend of mine said that we are now at a time where Christians can be persecuted uh, for for prayer. But there would come a time when you could be persecuted and a knock at the door could happen in your own home. Well, if you live in Scotland, that time has now come. In Scotland, the buffer zones, you can be persecuted for discussing abortion in your garden if you are overheard by someone. If you think I'm being paranoid, this is only going to happen outside abortion clinics, think again. If the government can create thought crimes somewhere, it's only a matter of time before they cre create them anywhere. If you hold any controversial views at odds with the government, and we all do at some level, watch out. God and God alone gives us the inalienable rights and freedoms. It's the government's job to uphold these freedoms, not to suppress them. How can we ask British troops to put their lives at risk defending freedom abroad whilst fining, arresting, and in your case, Isabel, imprisoning people back home for the thought crime of prayer. I appeal to the activists in the abortion industry, civil service, government and the legal system who have been lobbying so hard to make prayer a criminal offence to please look at your children and ask yourself, do I want my son or daughter to grow up in a country where their very thoughts can be criminalised? Is that really the country you want your children to inherit? So have we ended up with thought crime in Britain? It's because we've forgotten our first love and the principles upon which our once great nation was built. We are a Christian nation. Our constitution is based upon the Bible. The king's authority comes from Yahweh, the God of the Bible. If we are to restore our once great nation, we need to remember its foundations as set out in the Magna Carta 800 years ago. We need to return to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this court here has decided that even a silent prayer to the Lord God is now a criminal act. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you are concerned about the state of our nation and you don't know Jesus yet, I encourage you to read the Gospel of John and to visit your local church. I believe there is still time to restore sanity to our nation, but time is short and the church needs to wake up. Finally, I want to thank my wife, my son and my daughter who have been a tremendous source of strength. And I give thanks for the life of Jacob, who died in abortion, and Bobby, who died in a natural miscarriage. Although their lives were brief, they have inspired me and kept me going over the last two years. Thank you. Wow, this is wild. Imagine growing up in a world where you don't say anything, you don't do anything, you just think something and you get arrested. This is the direction that we're heading in if we don't stand up and speak out. And I'm making this video because, you know, there is a role of our conscience, our thoughts, and, and religious liberty, not just freedom of speech, but freedom of thought. Will we not be afforded the right to think what we want to think silently. And scripture emphasizes the importance of conscience in a believer's life. Paul speaks of the conscience as something that must remain clear before God. And even Peter instructs Christians to maintain a good conscience so that when we're slandered, when their good behavior in, in Jesus may, may put others to shame, that we need to be clear in our minds, even if others are going to criminalize us, because really it is a shame, right? This is a shame that this is happening in the 21st century. It is, it is 2024 and somebody has just been arrested two years ago and then now convicted of being a criminal for merely thinking something, for praying to their God silently on a street, in the public. You know, the, the New Testament frequently teaches that one's conscience, particularly in the matters of faith, it's sacred. It must be respected and protected. The violation here of religious liberty, human, human rights, 
particularly the right to, to pray silently, publicly, or to act according to one's conscience, to, to pray for my son who's passed, to pray for, in Adam's case, his, his child that has passed, to invoke our relationship, our individual relationship with God. This, this religious freedom should be made available for everybody. And this is not just a political right, but it is a theological imperative and it is a human right. This is a human right rooted in truth, rooted in biblical understanding that each person is accountable to God alone for their beliefs and their practices. And when the government seeks to control religious expression, religious thought, prayer, the government encroaches upon a fundamental human right and this principle of rights. And, you know, Adam's call to stand firm, Adam's call to wake up, even not just for the church, but even for those who would fear where the direction that their government's going to. It's not we're not that far off here in Canada. And the call to stand firm in the face of oppression is also biblical. And the Bible encourages Christians to stand firm in their faith, even in the face of opposition, persecution. In Ephesians 6, 13, we're instructed to put on the full army of God so that when the day of evil comes, and, and a day like this, where you're criminalized for publicly praying in your mind, these are, these are evil days. And as he says in Ephesians 6, that we would be able to stand our ground, stand firm. And, you know, we, we need to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the Lord's work. One of those things is prayer. In, in situations where prayer, your thought, your faith can be criminalized, the, the church's response, the Christian response is not, it shouldn't be one out of fear or to back down or to cower, but one of boldness, one of to speak out over this. And Christians are, are called to be the salt and the light, right? And, and we don't hide the light. We witness the truth of who Jesus is, even in hostile environments like this. And I commend Adam for doing just that. For, for standing firm in the faith, even when it, it could cost him. And you see here that he says God has kept him, surrounded him with prayer, somehow continue to provide for him. And it's a powerful testimony that God's hand is upon this man who is standing his ground in a place where ultimately we're reminded that earthly governments may fail to uphold justice and God's justice ultimately will prevail. In Psalms 2, we read about how the nations rage and the rulers of the earth set themselves against the Lord. And it's happening right now in the most advanced time of humanity. It's still happening today. God remains sovereign. Jesus remains king. The Holy Spirit continues to reign. And we're called to trust in God in times like this. We're, we're called to trust in God's ultimate authority, sovereignty in times like this, and that there is a promise that Christ will return to establish his kingdom, to establish a perfect government, to establish perfect justice. And in light of these principles, Adam Smith Connor, th this situation reflects a broader, broader spiritual battle that we're all facing, that ultimately the Lord will take care of him, take care of us, even when our earthly leaders fail us, even when the government fails us, because prayer, both silent and spoken, remains a powerful and indispensable means of communication with God that cannot be suppressed by human law. Now the devil and the demons will try to suppress that, but they will not prevail. They will not prevail. And it will take also people to speak up about this. And so if this video has spoken to you at all, and the situation has spoken to you at all, then spread the word. And we need to come together and really stand our ground here. And I think not just Christians, but every faith and religion should be afraid, but we shouldn't act out of that fear and cower away at it. We should act in boldness. And so there you have it, a biblical response to what's happening here. And I think one of our responses really is to pray. Continue to pray for the UK continue to pray for Canada, the US, and those that are trying to persecute prayer, persecute Christians, persecute lovers of Jesus Christ. And ultimately we know that government reigns, I mean, Christ reigns and government can temporarily suppress us, but ultimately Jesus will have victory. Remember that we are more than conquerors in Christ because of his great love for us. So there you guys have it. I hope that this has spoken to you and I hope that it will cause some of us at least to act. We need to. And so I hope you have a wonderful day wonderful afternoon, wonderful morning, wherever you are. And remember, you're more than conquerors. So stand your ground, speak up. Let this not be a time for us to cower and be afraid and act on that fear, but a time to rise up and be bold and speak out. And I pray and hope that you would too. God bless you guys. We'll see you again next time. Bye for now.